My name is Dr. Jean Wanjema. I'm an emergency medicine trained doctor who works at Aga Khan um, and I work closely with Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation. Really glad to see all of you here. Well, the numbers are just rising, rising, rising. Okay. So I think we'll just jump into it. I think, I hope everybody can hear me and see me clearly. Um, if you have any questions as we're going along, feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. I will ask a few questions as we're going along, so feel free to type in the chat box, okay? So tonight we're gonna to talk about how to think like an emergency care uh, provider. I think this is a very interesting talk. Um, to be honest, it was inspired by a couple of podcasts that I'd been listening to where they were delving deep into how um, emergency care providers think and act and operate because it's definitely not the same as everybody else. Um, so we're going to discuss a few things here and there because I think even for you guys, who've been practicing emergency medicine, you do realize it's a bit different than the regular clinical work. So yeah, I hope you'll learn something um, tonight and uh, I hope it sparks uh, a shift in your mindset and a bit of a change in what we've been doing. Okay, so let's get right into it. Okay, first things first, we start simple. Um, how would you de define an emergency? I'm sure a lot of us have gotten inundated by uh, patients, patient relatives, politicians, what wakubwa say, ah, ah, doctor, sister, whoever. It's an emergency, yeah? So do we all understand what an emergency is? What do we think or how do we define emergencies? Feel free to put in the chat box. How have you been trying to tell people or how have you understood what an emergency is? Let's see if we if our, we ourselves know so that we can also educate other people. Okay, Miriam says, it's an urgent thing that needs attention. Justice is unexpected dangerous situation. Absolutely, that's correct. Um, serious and unexpected, correct, Stacey. So yeah, um, those are some of the trigger words. It's a serious, in the context of medicine, it's a serious medical event um, that happens unexpectedly, is dangerous and life-threatening, okay? Um, it does require immediate attention, and nine out of 10 times, it's acute. So your patient who has come in with 10 years of back pain, that's not an emergency, okay? Um, but if something has changed, like if it's a sudden onset back pain after being hit by a car, that's an emergency. Okay, great. So just a bit of housekeeping. That is what how we define an emergency. Okay. So further on that one, um, how do we identify emergencies? Mm -hmm. So I've put three patient profiles on the screen. Um, are any of them emergencies or do we think they're all very stable patients and we shouldn't worry. Are they all sick? Are they not sick? Are they worth um, quick attention? Should they wait a little? So the first person is this man shouting at the nurse. Do we think he's sick or not sick? Do we think he's an emergency? Do we think he's stable? What do we think? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yep, Naomi says stable, Gideon says stable, Chapkiru says stable, absolutely, he's stable. Um, Maureen says stable, I think Jane says, I think it's not an emergency, that's absolutely correct. Most times, your loudest patients are the most stable, and the ones that can actually wait, they just don't want to wait, yeah. Um, how about the other two patients, what would we be concerned about um, in the one on the extreme right, the one on the gurney? What are we worried about? Are we worried at all or not worried? Do we think he needs a closer eye, a closer look? Yep, Naomi says polytrauma, yes, exactly. So I think this is a trauma patient. This is not a patient that you just walk past, right? The first guy you walk past and you'll probably snicker to yourself and be like, wait, 
Okay, I'm so sorry for the nurse who has to hear the noise. But this patient, yes, is sick. You're worried since it's a trauma patient, absolutely correct. How about the baby? What do we think about the baby? Are we happy about the baby? Are we a little worried? So it's a newborn baby just been born. Yes, they are crying. Mm -hmm. Are we worried or not worried? The baby looks blue. Absolutely correct, Nuko. Yes, the baby is blue. The baby is cyanotic. So you are worried. If that's how your baby comes in, you want to do your Afghan scores really quickly, they already, score, they already score rather low. They are blue. Their appearance is blue. So you want to intervene quickly. Okay, great. Next. Uh, so this two patients, different age profile, um, both have nosebleeds. So the child is probably like three, four, year, four years old, um, the elderly lady in her 70s, both have nosebleeds. Are we worried at all? Are we not worried? Are we worried about one over the other? Who would we attend to first? So four-year-old boy versus a 70-year-old woman, both have nosebleeds. Who are we worried about? Okay, Rosemary said she's worried about the boy, okay. Uh, Jane Chepkirui says the elderly first. Anwar says the four-year-old. Phineas says the older woman. Uh, two, two, two. Okay, somebody says the elderly first. Nuko says 71 is likely to have a posterior nosebleed. Judith says both, worried about both. Um, okay, all right. Okay, so we're kind of like in the 60% the older, 40% the younger. But a lot of people actually are worried. I'm seeing a lot more responses coming in. A lot of people are worried about the boy. Now, so these are those moments where as you're quickly <clears throat> prioritizing your patient, they're both sick that we give. Yes, they've both come with nosebleeds, okay? If you start thinking about, okay, what, what is the major cause of nosebleeds for most people? Most, especially if it's a child, they're likely to have picked their nose or they've fallen or things like that, okay? Um, however, children also have a better um, coping mechanism in terms of trauma and acute emergencies as opposed to elderly people. I personally would be more worried about the elderly patient because one, they're old, so they probably have multiple comorbids. They're probably on a million and one drugs, which you don't know, are they on anticoagulants? Are they on this, are they on that? The child is smiling at you. Um, maybe they picked their nose, okay? So while both, yes, raise concern, my priority would be to the older person first than the younger person. Are we understanding? So these are some of the small um, intricacies and nuances of being an emergency care physician. You have to under understand the pathology of different presentations first and the likely causes of the different uh, presentations and the different patient dynamics based on their age profile, their demographics, sometimes even race, because those are some of the red flags that you'll start having in your head when you see a patient. And that's how you'll end up prioritizing which one to see first, then the second one can be seen after that. Okay. Good. I hope that's clear. Okay. So basically what you've just done right now is triaging your patient, okay? Triage, uh, the etymology of triage is the French word um, that means to sort. So you're sorting your patients based on how sick are your patients, Yeah. Actually, the first question you ask yourself when you're triaging your patient, is my patient sick or not sick, okay? So then you go and you tend to the sick patients first. If your patient is stable, like the guy who was shouting at the nurse in the wheelchair, you're like, okay, you can wait. But with triage in hospital, the sickest person gets seen first because the sickest person is likely to need resuscitative care, likely to deteriorate, and as an emergency care provider, that is your priority, yeah? So we sort patients um, based on the severity of their clinical presentation. And then at the same time, as you're sorting your patient, especially because we have a lot of diversity in the groups that we're talking to today, 
people who work in high resource centers, lower resource centers, um, smaller tertiary hospital, smaller primary to secondary hospitals, like the level one, level twos, you also need to be cognizant of what can I handle in my hospital, yeah? And who is likely to benefit from my care at this point based on what I have available to me, okay? Those questions help you quickly assign your patients in order of priority and who gets seen first and who gets transferred and things like that, okay? So like I alluded, the first question you're asking yourself when a patient comes to hospital, is the patient sick or not sick, okay? Sick is, um, this basically just means, it's a quick glance at a patient, yeah? You quickly glance at them, you see what they're complaining on, their general appearance. Do they look stable? Do they look like one of their systems is compromised? Um, I'm more concerned about uh, a patient who looks like they're breathing fast and they're quiet as opposed to somebody who is shouting, right? So that's that's kind of the idea of assigning whether they're sick or not sick because that also in your head triggers you to say, I don't need to spend too much time with this patient and my energy is better spent on this other patient, okay? So that's your first question, sick versus not sick, okay? So as you're finding out, are they sick or not sick, all your patients will fall into um, a traffic light kind of uh, pattern, okay? Mm -hmm. Red, yellow, green, and black, okay? So red, are you really, really sick patients who need care right now? They're the ones who you cannot walk past. You cannot say, oh, I'll see them after 20 minutes because probably in those 20 minutes, you wouldn't have a pulse anymore. So these red patients are your emergency patients that need intervention now, that need you to quickly assess, quickly manage, and be on high alert, okay? Your yellow patients, yes, they are the sick patients, but they're not dying, okay? So they're in that borderline four. Let's say maybe it's an asthma patient has come in with an acute asthmatic attack. You don't want them to wait outside for 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour, because they could decompensate. So you need to stabilize your patient so that they do not progress into the red zone, okay? So you're sick patients, but not dying, but could deteriorate, okay? Then green is makes up almost 90% of the patients who come to an emergency department and an outpatient center, um, especially in our local settings. We don't, not all hospitals um, can separate your outpatient and your emergency department. So green are the people who walk in, they have a flu, they have a cough, they have a, a sprain, those kinds of things. The, not so serious, but you can't dismiss them because they've come to hospital, but they're not dying. They're not sick, but they're not dying, okay? So they're your green patients. Um, then now black. Black is very dependent on your setting, your resources, and your hospital policies, okay? Black are those patients who say, I work in a health center, there's been a really bad accident. This motorcycle rider has been hit. He's brought in. He has, he's, he's bleeding from his face. He has multiple facial fractures. His air is at risk, you know, like he just has multiple issues. In my health center, I don't even have a laryngoscope. So that's a patient who, if you can urgently just transfer them, because you know you can't do much for them. Either you urgently transfer them or you have expectant management. They're, they're, the gravity of their, their presentation is not something that you can handle and likely they will um, progress to death. So that's your black patient. Mm -hmm. It's a very touchy subject, very um, sensitive scenario, especially when it comes to mass casualty events where the number of patients coming into a hospital out, outweigh or um, overstretch the facilities within the hospital. So those are your black patients. But most important, you need to identify what you can do and what your patient presents with. Are they red? Are they yellow? Are they green? Okay. And you always start with the red. Okay. So further into that, question two is, so we've said patient is sick, okay? We've done sick, not sick, then we've said, yes, they are sick. 
Now you need to ask yourself, how sick are they? And that's where the traffic light comes in. So are they red? Do they need resuscitation? So red, you do your ABCDEs, yeah? And one of the systems is compromised and compromised in a life-threatening way, okay? So the airway is at risk or it's an unresponsive patient or they're actively convulsing um, or maybe they have a, a tension pneumothorax, those kind of major traumas. Um, bleeding a lot, upper GI bleeds, those kind of patients. Those are your red patients. You need to resuscitate them and you need to resuscitate them now because if you don't, they are going to die, okay? Um, so you have to move these patients into your emergency resuscitation areas. For you to be able to work and have the best outcomes, you have to have dedicated areas. You can't have a patient with an upper GI who you want to intubate in the waiting area with coughs and colds. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't work, it's not efficacious. So you have to have a dedicated resuscitation area for these red patients, okay? Now, if your patient is not a red patient, but something tells you that you're still concerned about them, and by that something, it has to be very, um, it, you have to back it up by numbers and clinical presentation. So maybe it's an asthma patient who's having an acute asthmatic attack. They're breathing at like 25 breaths per minute. They're desaturating. They're, they haven't gone into red zone, but you're worried about this patient, okay? So you want to intervene now and stabilize your patient before they decompensate to red and then black, okay? Because majority of our patients, especially in the county hospitals, they'll fall in our yellow zone and sometimes our red zone. These are very critical moments for your patients because if you're unable to identify that they're in a yellow zone, impending red or impending black, you will not be able to allocate resources adequately. These are patients you have to flag from the jump, from the entry, because once you identify and intervene, you can stop the progression into peri-arrest. Okay. Um, so you can stop the progression into peri-arrest. We also have to remember that in a lot of our centers, especially in the peripheries, if a patient arrests, when you try and resuscitate, you have to ask yourself, what is next for your patient? If you're in a center that you don't have anybody who can intubate, you don't have a critical care center, if you rosk, what next? Yeah. What next for your patient? Your patient, post trust care, airway, you intubate. If you don't have somewhere to take that patient, are you doing a disservice to your patient if you don't arrest the progression from the jump, from yellow and red? Everything else after that is just a downhill battle and will be quite a big struggle because you'll start saying, oh, I need to refer this patient. The next facility is 20 kilometers away. The ambulance is far away. So is somebody going to be there? Let's say maybe you've managed to intubate. Is somebody going to be there bagging the whole time, even before the ambulance comes, en route from the ambulance to the transfer facility if the transfer goes through? So those are some of the things you also have to think about, yeah? You have to anticipate the um, where your patient will end up. And you also have to think about the worst case scenario. Because when you think about the worst case scenario, you can put stopgap measures to prevent that from happening. And that's exactly how you have to think when you're in an emergency care center. Okay. So we've talked about red, we've talked about yellow. Some patients you screen, they don't have red. You screen, they don't have yellow. Check the vital signs again, okay? Vital signs can also be the one thing that tips you over into yellow. Maybe they have a really bad tachycardia. Maybe they have really bad, really high respiratory rate. That can tip you into yellow. But if your vital signs are all within normal and you have no flags in terms of clinical presentation, you'd want to let your patient wait. Reassure them, yes, you will be seen, but you, it might take some time because you're a green patient. Okay. Yep. So that's how you stratify your patients in terms of how sick is my patient. Okay. So the third question that goes in line with this is, who do I admit? 
Who do I transfer? Who do I discharge? Okay. Um, without discussion, all red patients should be admitted. Okay. The only exception is if you're transferring to a center where, let's say maybe they have a heart attack and uh, all you can do for them is uh, give them aspirin, then you transfer. But all red patients are to be admitted either at your hospital or another hospital where they'll benefit from uh, more advanced care. But all red patients, no discussion, admit, because they can't go home. They're not going, you can't discharge them. They're almost at the brink of tipping over. They're at the brink of tipping over into arrest, yeah? So these patients, you cannot discharge them. Okay, you must admit them. Then as you're reviewing your yellow and your green patients, some patients will end up being admitted as well. That's also based on their clinical presentation, your supporting laboratory or uh, radiological investigations as well, because some patients may end up being green patients in terms of their triage, um, but they actually have very serious problems, right? So like I said, some yellow, some green will be admitted. Um, most greens will be discharged with the exception of a few of them, but most greens end up going home. You're not worried about them. It's the flus, the sprains, the what the headaches, the mild headaches, those kind of people. Um, so then yellow, some of them will go home. If it's, um, like I said, if it's an asthma patient who you stabilize, you nebulize, they stabilize, you, you observe them for a couple of hours and they're fine, those can go home. Um, so it's just based on the clinical presentation and you have to keep reassessing your patient. The patients that you transfer are the ones that you know your facility cannot handle. Like I said, if you have a patient who's presented with a heart attack, you have no business admitting them for two hours, 48 hours, waiting for troponins to come in when already they have like ECG changes that tell you it's an MI. Those are patients that you stabilize quickly, give them aspirin, make sure they're not having impending organ damage, and then you transfer to an area of definitive care. Because if you don't do that, you're you're going to waste their precious time in terms of how much more their body can compensate. Um, yeah, so also time is brain, time is muscle, all those things you need to remember. If you cannot handle a patient, don't hold on to them. Send them where you know they can be sorted out. But it also has to be a justified transfer. Okay. So let's break that monotony. Let's have some practical applications, okay? Um, so let's do a few scenarios. Okay, first scenario. I just want you guys to tell me, is your patient red? Is the patient yellow? Is the patient green? Is the patient black, if applicable, okay? Um, so the first scenario, patient walks into the hospital, um, says he has some arm pain, he fell while playing football. On exam, you can see an obvious deformity of the arm. It's obviously broken. Respiratory rate is 18, radial pulse is 124. He's, however, alert, awake, and is crying of pain. How would we stratify this patient? Red, yellow, green, black. Is your patient sick, not sick? How sick are they? Okay. Fred, Frederick Komondi says red. Diana says red. Uh, Evelyn says yellow. Ken Met says yellow. Uh, Purity, yellow. Priscilla, yellow. Uh, Jane Chepkurui, red. Red, yellow, yellow. Okay. Most people say yellow. Okay. All right. Uh-huh. Yep, lots of yellows. Yellow. Jeno Sheno says red. Anton Ongwao says yellow. Okay, yellow. All right. Okay. So, is your patient sick or not sick? Patient is sick. Okay, so how sick is your patient? As you go back to the previous triage. Um, red is for life-threatening, uh, life-threatening, illnesses that need emergent care, like now, now. Yellow, yes, you're sick. We need to intervene, but um, you're not going to die, right? So this patient, would you see them right now? 
you can take some time. Yes, they're in pain. You'd need to square, um, what's the word? You'd need to um, do your severity scoring. Sometimes, yeah, pain severity can end up tipping you over um, into yellow. So this patient can be green and yellow, but definitely not red, okay? Because they're stable, they're talking, their airway is not at risk, they're breathing okay. They have a tachycardia, yes, could be because of the pain. So you might want to give some painkillers, reassess, you want to splint, those kinds of things. But this patient can wait, okay? This patient can wait. All right, let's do the next one, scenario two. Uh, Kennedy or Moya says splinting will alleviate the pain. That is very true. Okay, scenario two. Patient is brought in by ambulance, has an open head wound. Um, EMTs have controlled the bleeding by applying a pressure bandage. Respiratory rate is 16, pulse rate is 88. He's unconscious. Where would we stratify? Yes, patient is sick, definitely. Is it red? Is it yellow? Is it green? Where do we go? Okay. Okay, everybody says red. Okay, great. All right. Yep, so this patient is definitely red. They are unconscious. Even just that, that one statement, they are red. You need to attend to them right now, okay? Um. So, yep, everybody, yep, good. At least everyone got that one correct red patient you need to intervene right now because they could be just about they're in peri arrest they could just die if you don't intervene okay scenario three patient is brought in uh, by relatives stating that he can't move or feel his legs or arm his respiratory rate is 26 pulse rate is 110 he's awake and oriented is he sick or not sick definitely sick is he red yellow green Black, what do we think? Okay. Most people are saying yellow. Um, some people say green. Some people say red. Red, red, green, green, yellow, yellow, green, yellow. Okay. Yellow, green, yellow. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So for these patients, you also need to anticipate what could be the problem, right? So this patient is a yellow patient, okay? Um, what do you think? Yes, Douglas says, query stroke. It could be a stroke, yes, that's one thing. Um, you definitely would need more information in terms of history, when did the symptoms start, any pre-existing conditions, because that will also help you figure out what could be going on. But this patient has an obvious um, system being affected. So central nervous system is being affected. He can't he can't move his legs or arm. He could be having um he could be having a stroke. Um you're worried about that. If it's a GBS patient, you're thinking maybe he's having some respiratory comp compromise. He also has a tachycardia. So this isn't somebody that you'd want to wait. Can't be a green, okay? Definitely not a green, but he's not in impending arrest. So he falls into the yellow. You're worried about him, but you're glad that he's not about to die on you now. Okay? Scenario four. Patient, victim of an accident. Um, when you're examining, you can hear gargles from the mouth. They can't maintain an open airway. Uh, they're not breathing. They have a weak carotid pulse and they're unresponsive. So um, based on your center, I want you guys to tell me how you would classify your patient. Okay. Mm-hmm, I'm seeing, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of reds. I'm seeing some blacks as well. Yep, yep, black, black, red, red, red. Okay. So this is your it depends patient and it's very, um, reliant on your facility, okay? This patient, airway is at risk. They need to be intubated. They need C-spine. They need all these things. They need CT scans, da, da, da. They need neurosurgical review, the whole shabai, okay? So if your center cannot manage all of that, that patient ends up being black, okay? If you're in a high resource setting and you know you can intubate your patient, you can um, 
do C-spine control, you can put on a ventilator, you can send for imaging, CT scans and the likes, then they are red. You attend to them there and then. But if you're in a low resource setting, that is a black patient, if you're able to transfer them to a high resource setting immediately, you can try and stabilize. But if you're not, it's impending. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. I hope we're all understanding how we just think about these patients. You're thinking about their presentation and you're thinking about what could it be as well as thinking about what can I do for this patient, okay? All right. So this is just a very superficial way of looking at things, but it should trigger in you um, what are the red flags that I need to identify for my patients, okay? What are the red flags? Okay, scenario five. This patient comes to casualty just like that. That's what that's all you see. You don't have vitals, you don't have uh, any details or anything. You just see them grasping at their chest. Are they sick or not sick? They're definitely sick. Yeah. So are they red? Are they yellow? Are they green? Are they black? Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of reds. Can somebody justify why you think it's a red? Michael says it's green. Can you justify why it's green? Paul says it's yellow. Please justify why it's yellow. Okay. Burial says, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So most people are saying they put it as red because it could be an MI. Okay. Some people are saying yellow because they need more history. Okay. Uh, and of course, it's red until we rule out an emergency cause of chest pain, which is an MI. Okay, could be an MI, could be a heart attack. Exactly. So that's true. Um, so one, the little information that you have is, okay, Priscilla says he walks to the hospital, so he's green. Okay. So the little information that you have from this picture, there is chest pain, it is an elderly male. Those are your two pieces of information from this. Okay. Both of these are red flags, okay? First of all, I'm going to say a very controversial statement. Men don't like coming to the hospital unless it's serious in our setting, right? Um, so a lot of the times if anybody comes in with chest pain, okay, you want to make sure it's not an ischemic cause or a myocardial infarction. So that automatically catapults them to being red. So this, this image that is on your screen, if you have the casualty app or the EMKF algorithms, it is the first thing that you will see, adult triage criteria. It is a triage criteria from WHO, Red Cross, and um, MSF in conjunction. So if you read through it, the first red is airway breathing, like ABCDs, right? Airway breathing, then circulation, then disability, and others includes ECG with acute ischemic changes, okay? So you have to do an ECG on this patient. So this patient automatically jumps the queue till you do your ECG, okay? If your ECG is suggestive, they stay red. If your ECG is fine, you can move to continue with, qualify with your vital signs and the, and the duration of illness and all that to see if they are green or yellow, okay? All right, good. So in a nutshell, your patient approach, when you're about to see a patient, you're going to ask yourself, am I resuscitating? Am I just stabilizing or am I discharging? Okay. And more often than not, it correlates with the, um, the color coded system. Okay. Red resuscitate always. Okay. Red resuscitate always. Find out what the emergency is, what organ system it is compromising and intervene accordingly okay yellow will be stabilized they'll have they're sick they're not critical but if you don't stabilize they could tip into critical yeah i like using the asthma thing because it's a very clear progression they start stable mild symptoms progress get more tachypneic uh, then end up having silent chest and respiratory arrest, yeah? So once you identify them early enough, you can stabilize and stop that progression, okay? Then um, patients who are stable, who don't have any red flags, who vital signs are within normal, 
you want to manage as green and very likely you'll end up discharging them, okay? So as an EM physician, a lot of quick decisions are made with very little information, okay? Just like the scenarios we've just done, very little information has been availed, yeah? So I like that some people are saying it depends. That's a very good um, way to phrase it. But a lot of the times you won't have too much time to, especially with your red patients, you won't have too much time to ask more questions. So you'll have to act, make very quick decisions. That's why we have the systematic ABCD approach, assess your airway. Um, if there's any compromise, intervene. Assess your breathing. If there's any compromise, intervene. Assess your circulation. If there's any compromise, intervene. Because you don't have time to take 30 minutes worth of history, including history or family history, social history, or were there any complications around your birth? You don't have time to take all those things into consideration. So it's about identifying your red flags very, very quickly and intervening, uh, making quick decisions, and then gathering more information as you go, because you need to keep reassessing, okay? Another very important thing about uh, EM providers, you should always, always have the worst in mind to start with, okay? Always think, my patient could die, right? Even if your patient comes in with a cough and flu-like symptoms, you want to make sure that you've ruled out all the other possible causes that could kill them, okay? Um, I'll give you a very real example. There's a patient I had. Young lady came in with, um, young lady came in with flu-like symptoms. She had a bit of a cough, runny nose. She had traveled, so it was, and it was even around COVID time. So as I'm taking the history, I'm like, do you have fevers? No. Do you have difficulty breathing? She's like, well, not really. But when I take a deep breath, I have a bit of pain, and I'm like, hmm, okay, it's not really normal to have pain when you take a deep breath. So that already was a flag in my head. And then um, I'll admit, I'll, I think like most people, um, you might not always examine every patient that comes to you, especially when they come with very benign symptoms. But for this patient, once she said that she was having a bit of difficulty breathing, um, pain when she took a deep breath in, and the fact that she had traveled, she said that she had gone on a, she had traveled, she was on holiday, had taken a, I don't know, six, seven hour flight. So in my head, I took note of that, okay? And I was like, let me listen to her chest. So I listened to her chest, auscultated. Um, she actually did have some reduced breath sounds. So that triggered me. I'm like, you need to do an x-ray. So we did a chest x-ray, came back. She actually had a spontaneous pneumothorax. This is a patient who, if we didn't identify any of those small fairly mundane red flags because some people do have some pleuritic chest pain and it's neither here nor there or some muscular chest pain and whatnot but if you don't probe further and confound your decision making based on data data meaning physical exam history vitals how vitals are normal now you're prompted to do to get more information right so sent her for an x-ray then we found she had a pneumothorax she had no business having a pneumothorax, right? But since my mind was biased to the worst case scenario, I was able to pick it up as opposed to thinking, oh, all my patients are fine. Nobody is dying. So that's definitely a mindset that we all need to have when dealing with emergency patients or patients who present to an emergency department. You have to always think the worst could possibly be happening until proven otherwise. It's like saying the opposite, guilty until proven otherwise, right? they will have something that could kill them unless you prove beyond reasonable doubt that they don't have it, okay? And that also is um, supplemented by my next bullet point. Always have differential diagnosis. Even if you're 99% sure that it is a flu, you should also just rule out anything else. Rule out any other pulmonary, um, like this patient, rule out a pneumothorax, Rule out, there's some people who come with just chest pain and a cough. Rule out hemoptysis. Rule out, you know, those things that could kill your patient. Always have at least two differential diagnoses and make it clear for yourself. And if somebody were to read your notes in terms of your history taking, 
find out if there are any symptoms that point towards it, find out if there are any clinical signs in terms of like their vitals or in your examination that can bolster your decision to say, no, this patient is safe to go home. Okay. All right. Now, my next point, learn to anticipate the patient course. So this is for all your patients, honestly. So if you see a patient and they are green, um, they, they, you, you categorize them as green, stable patients, um, vitally stable, no, no red flags. You should anticipate that. Maybe you'd still want to do a few investigations here and there. Maybe someone has come in with diarrhea. Um, you're not sure if they have an AKI, so you're doing some labs. As you're waiting for the labs, nothing stops you from writing a discharge paperwork or putting in a prescription. Sometimes life gets busy. These are some tips and tricks that you need to learn how to manage your units, your patient load, because some patients have nothing but they're on the borderline. You're not too sure when you invest, when you talk to them and examine them. So you do some tests just to rule out and you expect that they'll be discharged. So plan for your discharge. So by the time you're already seeing them, it becomes a quick, hi, I've reviewed your labs. You're perfectly fine. Here's your prescription. Bye. Okay. On the flip side, if it is your yellow patients who are in your unit for a while, they're getting some treatment, anticipate in terms of your differential diagnosis, if it's a lady who comes with right iliac fossa pain, you're thinking anything from appendicitis to um, ectopic to ovarian torsion and all that, right? So you should anticipate the tests that you'd need to do, anticipate the patient course, whether they'll be admitted or not. And then also in, in, uh, in tandem with making the lives of the rest of your team, even including your admitting team, a lot easier. So these are patients where do your PDT early, okay? If you think they need like a CT scan with, with contrast, do your UECs early, give them painkillers. Note that even like if it's your headache patient, um, anticipate their course, say, okay, I've taken history, uh, they don't have any red flags at this moment, but their pain is quite severe. So I'm going to give them the first round of analgesia. When you Give them the first round of analgesia. Give yourself the leeway to top up um, if they're not getting better. So you anticipate either there'll be more red flags in terms of pain control and I'll need to top up one or two. So I'll need to image this patient or um, you give them analgesia, they'll be fine and they'll go home. Try and anticipate your patient's course because it also make your workload a lot easier and it will also hasten your patient's hospital stay because it would be very unfair to your patient if let's say it's the appendicitis patient you're thinking it might be appendicitis she's a female you give her analgesia she doesn't get better uh, she's still very tender and you're like okay I need to scan this patient and then by the time you want to scan the patient you've not even done any of your labs so now they have to wait for those labs to come out again and then you'll eventually send them for the scan so that ends up being a longer patient course than if you saw the patient, ordered your labs immediately. It's kind of like, um, there's an emergency physician who described it as a one-touch approach, okay? When you go see your patient, examine them, take your history. Once you leave the room, make sure you know the labs you need to do, the imaging you need to do, and the course of your patient, whether they're being admitted or discharged. Sometimes the latter, the last part, is very dependent on the information you get. but Always have a one-touch approach for your patient. Go in knowing um, I'll need to. These are the questions I want to ask. These are the red flags I'm looking for. If I have any of these red flags, these are investigations I need to do and set yourself up for success, okay? And that way, your patient flow will be a lot faster and easier, okay? Another thing, keep reassessing your patients. Some of your yellow patients may, will be neither here nor there, Um like with pain management, there are patients who pain doesn't go away with your first analgesia, um, and that will prompt, that will be the only red flag that you have for them that will prompt you to do more investigations. Um, patients who you're nebulizing, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? So keep reassessing your patient because your patient condition could either change for the better or the worse. And whichever way that goes, it 
impacts how you manage the patient and how much more energy you need to spend there. Okay. Okay. Mm. Now, another very, very important thing is you have to stay calm. You have to be very, very calm. There's so many times that have been asked by like patient relatives and other doctors like, oh, Jean, how do you stay so calm in an emergency? For me, the price of panicking is too high, too high a price that I, than I can afford, okay? So you always have to stay calm. And the only way that you will stay calm is, of course, when you're new, you'll struggle, 100%. But the more you do, the more you know. The more you read, the more you know. The more you consult, the more you know, okay? The more patterns you can be able to identify. Um, the more you read the algorithms that tell you point blank, step one, step two, step three, step four, that helps you calm down because the decisions that you need to make personally are removed from you. You end up moving from um, this, that, there's this thing about um, analytical thinking or types of thinking. There's type one, which is very um, automatic, like things that you do without even thinking about them, right? So things that happen by second nature, like you just go into a groove, you don't have to think about it. And then there's type two where you have to stop, think about it, analyze, do one plus one is two, da, 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 da. Okay, so those are the two types of thinking. The more you work in an emergency care center, the more you interact with algorithms and emergency care uh, protocols, the easier it is for you to shift from being a type two thinker to a type one thinker, which even in the long run is better for your patients because you make decisions for your patients faster. And number two, it's less, less exhausting for you because you can imagine if you have a day where you're the one um, on the floor and you get like 10 emergency patients, imagine thinking actively about 10 critically ill patients from start to finish can be a very draining process as opposed to if you lean into one available resources and hospital protocol protocols because that way it's it becomes very automatic okay but this is said under the caveat that you still have to make sure that you're taking your patient's presentation um into context your patient scenario into context not every patient is the same but a lot con a lot of the emergency conditions can be managed the same way okay um so you need to as you continue to work in an ed or an emergency department or emergency care center you start to become more of a type one thinker like i said where it's more automatic where you're able to identify red flags a lot faster and act on them. Um, so in that regard, you end up having clinician gestalt instincts that tell you, I, this is not right, right? So it, it ends up being like, as you're walking past a patient, you notice that they have a tachycardia of 123. They shouldn't. So you want to ask more questions like what's happening here? Um, is it something that warrants like my full attention? Is it something that's mundane? Or maybe it's somebody who um, has presented with maybe toe pain and then for some reason their saturations are 90. Why? Why do they have toe pain and they're hypoxic? So always trust your instincts. And the only way to build on that ability is to expose yourself to more cases, expose yourself to more patients, expose yourself to more information. Okay. All right. So lean into your resources because obviously you can't know everything. And even um, as you're making all these decisions, you need to have quick reference guides because I, you shouldn't be expected to know the dosage of every drug, right? So information that's easily available and that you can easily get on your hands or on your phone, whether it's a printout algorithm or the casualty app, um, be capable of leaning into those. Allow your brain to only hold the necessary information that you need. And then the one that you deem unnecessary, you can get from your resources, okay? 
So always refer. The Casualty app is a good guide. It's an amazing guide. I use it almost daily, to be honest, even up to today. Um, I don't bother remembering uh, drug doses for most things, especially if it's not an emergency. So I always just refer. And the Casualty has Casualty app has everything from airway-related emergencies, seizures, all the way to antimicrobial uh, preferences and choices for different infections. So find these resources and lean into them um, and don't be afraid to refer, okay? it it There's no shame in referring. There's no shame in consulting. Yep. So also, also with your colleagues, if you've identified somebody who is more of a type one thinker and is a lot faster on their feet, make friends with them, try and understand what they've seen, how they perceive situations, get their opinion on your patients when you're not so sure. Because like I said, as you're newer to the field, it becomes harder, but the more you practice, the easier it gets. But you can also find even veterans, if it's something that they've never treated before, they're also naive or they've treated only once, they will also consult because there's no there's no shame in consulting. There's no ego in this thing. Okay. Right. So EM providers never, ever work alone. Never. Never. Can you imagine trying to run a code blue by yourself? So you'll be the one doing chest compressions. You'll be the one bagging. You'll be the one defibrillating. You'll be the one giving meds. You'll be the one timing. It's not possible. And as true it is for codes, it's also true for other things. Any sick patients, you need more than one person treating them or managing them, yeah? Because they always need, they might need oxygen, they might need, um, they'll need uh, IV medications, they might need even catheterizations and things like that. They'll need investigations, they'll need x-rays, all that. We all work together. And the beauty of working together is you can skill share. Somebody might be better at, I don't know, reducing a dislocated shoulder than you. Somebody might be better at chest compressions than you. Somebody might be better at um, delegating than you. Somebody might have more information. Maybe they've dealt with something. Because whenever we work in a hospital, we gather so many people from different backgrounds. So maybe... On this day, you get a snake bite patient and you have somebody who worked in the coastal region and was an expert in snake bites. And you, you've never seen a snake ever, but you can't hold on to that patient. Ask, share information. You work together, work well together. Yep. So foster good relationships in your teams. Make sure um, that you can all work well together because once an emergency strikes, you need to move like a well-oiled machine. There's no time for second guessing, questions, blah, blah, blah. you all need to be comfortable and confident in each other to do what you're supposed to do and in the right way and in the right time. And we're all here for the patient. Okay. Um. So, yeah, communication is very important, especially because you're working in a team and you're working with other people, you're not just in your head. So when you see a patient, um. Make sure everybody who is part of the care team for the patient knows what the plan is. Because if you're the only person on the ground handling multiple patients, your team members will help you manage your patient better than you can do it alone. Say you get a patient, one who is in diabetic ketoacidosis. There are so many things that go into managing a patient with DKA. You have to do regular sugars, regular ketone checks. You have to give fluids. You have to give insulin. You have to give potassium. You have to do labs. So all these things you can't do on your own. So make sure once you've seen the patient with your one-touch approach, go tell your team, okay, I think this patient has DKA. This is what we're going to do. We're going to admit them. We need to start fluids. We need to do sugars. This is it. Because even them, they'll help keep you accountable. Because sometimes you forget. Most times you forget a couple of things. Because once you get one patient, then you're given a second patient you'll forget about the timelines you need to meet with your first patient because you're focused on your second patient or if there's a distraction here or there, or if you go for like, yeah. So when patients keep coming in, you need to be able to have confidence in your team. And the only way you'll have confidence in your team is you're able to communicate clearly what the plan for the patient's care is. 
Now, another thing that um, we often forget is to communicate with the patient themselves, okay? If your patient is conscious, you have to tell them what is going on. Say, Mr. So-and-so, um, I think you have this based on A, B, C, D, E. If you look at that, if they're on a monitor, show them the monitor, explain to them, this is your saturation, it's lower than normal. This is your blood pressure, it's lower than normal. How we are going to address this is by giving you oxygen, by giving you fluids, and then we'll reassess. If it does not work, we'll have to escalate to more things. Once you explain your plan of management to the patient, one, they're also on your team. Yeah, they have confidence in you because you look like you know what you're doing, right? And then they're also more cooperative and they're more likely to agree to your management plan as opposed to somebody who you don't explain what is happening. I've been in a scenario where there was a polytrauma patient who had a massive hemothorax. We needed to put a chest tube urgently, but nobody had explained it to him. So he was just like, no, what? You're going to stick what in my wear? Absolutely not. So once we took time to explain to him, okay, listen, um, you can see you're breathing really fast. You see the pain you're having. This is, um, these are your numbers. We've done an x-ray. It shows that you have this and we need to do this. Once he understood all of that, he was like, yeah, bet, go, go for it. Um, do what you need to do. Okay. So involve your patient because it's also about them. They also have patient autonomy. They have the right to agree to your care and refuse your care. So involve them in the decision-making process because even some patients, um, when it comes to discussing things like end-of-life care and um, patients who, if you, you can possibly discharge them, who live near the hospital, those are factors that you'll have to take in consideration when you're managing your patients. So loop them in, okay? Another team that you have to talk to is the definitive care team, okay? If you have a trauma patient, you need to loop in the surgeons. If you have a um, IMED patient, talk to the IMED guys. If you have a pediatric patient, talk to the pediatricians. Loop them in as soon as possible, but don't waste their time. Don't give them useless information, number one. Number two, don't loop them in so that they can take over the patient and take over your problems. No, it doesn't work like that. You're all... Doctors, nurses, CEOs, paramedics, whatever. You all have information. You all have a role to play. You can't just hand over that role so that it's someone else's business. That's bad medicine. That's bad care. Okay. And it's detrimental to your patient. You're the one who sees the patient first. You, as the emergency care provider, has have seen more emergencies than um no disrespect, than somebody who's who does regular stable clinic work, okay? So in that moment, you are a bit of the expert. So you can't just hand over that prerogative or that uh, responsibility to somebody else and then say, oh, the, the consultant or the, the admission team have taken the patient over. No, you still have a very, very important role to pay, play. So even when you do call for assist from a definitive care team, you need to be very clear as to what you need them to do. And you need to give them all the possible information that they need to make good judgment calls. So that means that take a good history, examine your patient thoroughly, make sure your vitals, you have all your vitals, right? Do your adjunct um, imaging as needed or labs as needed so that you can boister the, what you're about to tell them so that once you tell them you're like hey uh so and so i need a b c d e from you i need you to come and take this patient to theater because we've done this 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 and they have this i need you to admit this patient for this 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 because we've done this 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 okay so it can't just be come see the patient the patient work or it's your patient it doesn't work like that and that's very unfair to your patients and very unfair to your team and even after the fact, you won't be able to work well together, okay? So yeah, make sure you do your part so that the other person can also come in and do their part and you have very good patient outcomes, okay? Another very, very important point 
please document everything. What you think versus what you do versus what you write sometimes are three different things. The nature of emergency care is very sick patients, very sick patients who could either survive or could die, okay? You don't want to be found negligent for one reason or another, okay? You don't want to be told. I think for me, the one thing that I dread if I come to work and then someone says, oh, Jean, you remember that patient you saw? I get like a, my, my stomach just drops because I'm like, did I, did I kill someone? Like, did I, did, I, did I miss something, right? Did I screw up? So make sure that one, you're thinking about, like we said, have a bias to the worst case scenario and justify why you're letting this patient go home if you're discharging them, justify, write a whole like proper justification that I ruled out this, I ruled out this, I ruled out this, I did this, I did this. Yeah. Write it all down and write it clearly. Yes. Even the image tells you when you think you lose a lot of water, but once you write it down, at least you can collect something. Yeah. And for future reference, it's, it really saves you because a lot of the times you'll even forget what you did, what you said. Uh, but if you do write it down, when someone comes to question you, they'll be like, okay, um, per your documentation, I can see you were thinking about this, 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 and it's good that you rule them out. Yep. Another thing is for your... Um, patient dynamics are very different, okay? You'll have patients who, once you tell them, I want to admit you, they'll be like, Sure, go ahead. There are those who be like, I is it really that serious? There are those who outrightly say no, right? So for these patients who might want to leave the hospital against medical advice, you have to discuss with them clearly why it is against medical advice and the possible outcomes of them leaving the hospital. Personally, when I'm signing a leave against medical, I tell people, you know you could die. I tell them outrightly because it's true. Nine out of 10 times, it's true. You, you're desaturating. You're like, oh, I don't want to be admitted. Da, da, da. Hypoxia is one of the H's and T's. You could die. Tell them and write it down, okay? Make sure that they understand and write it down, okay? That's number one. Patients who are more low risk um, but have a likelihood of getting worse, like we said, anticipate your patient's uh, progress or course, right? So you could get a patient who presented with one day history of runny nose, sore throat, and a mild cough. They're at the start of a flu-like prodrome. So tell them what could happen in the next couple of days. Explain to them, likely this is how this will happen, da, da, da. Should you feel like you're having difficulty breathing, you can't catch your breath, if you can monitor your oxygen at home and it's below this level, tell them all those things. Because one, they'll know what to look out for. They'll know what it actually means to have an emergency and to need to come in. That's number one. Number two, you'll have a lot of patients. You Okay, let me put it this way. You can end up um, decongesting your emergency room with repeat visits. Yeah, because someone can start having a flu day one. Then day three, they develop a cough. They come back. They're like, ah, ah, Dr. G, I have a cough now. They come back day five. They're like, no, my cough hasn't gone away. So if you explain to them what is happening and you um, clearly explain what the danger signs are and when they need to come back, you make your life easier and their life easier as well. Yeah. So that's just safety net all your patients, okay? Safety netting is exactly what I've just explained. Tell the patient what possible cause they could have. Explain the danger signs that they that they should look out for and explain to them where they should come should those things happen. Safety net all your patients, especially those patients who you're not so sure about, you're heavy heavy about, you're like, oh, they could get better, they could get worse, that you're on the fence. Safety net your patients. Safety net all your patients, okay? It's better for the patient and better for you. And document it, make sure you document it. Okay. Another very important thing that I have learned 
um, as I started doing emergency medicine, is to always stay curious. Don't just take things at face value. Make the word why your favorite word. Why, why is my patient coughing? Why is my patient having difficulty breathing? Why is my patient desaturating? Why is my patient tachycardic? Why, 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 why? The more you ask why, one, around your patient presentation, the more likely you are to pick up red flags, the more likely you are to pick up pathologies that could deteriorate and get worse. Okay, that's number one. Number two, always ask yourself, why am I giving this drug versus this drug? Why am I doing this treatment versus this treatment? Because once you understand how, this is something that honestly should have been taught in our various schools, but I personally, I didn't really get much of it. Um, we have a lot of cram culture where you just cram for an exam and you don't, you just, yeah, you're told, yeah, give da 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 da. And then you don't understand why you're doing this. So the more you ask why around how you're treating your patients, the easier it is for you to understand what is happening to them, number one, so you can effectively manage them. Number two, you can also explain to them because patient information is very important, yeah? So you need to understand is the patient going to get better with the treatment that I'm going to give them? Is the patient going to survive despite what I'm going to do to them? Yeah, is what I'm going to do to them beneficial or not? And explain to them, especially like now in this age where this time where there's, there's a really bad influenza um, surge going around, everybody wants a cough syrup. Are you going to prescribe it? Why are you prescribing it? Should you prescribe it at all? Why shouldn't you prescribe? Ask yourself those questions. Ask yourself um, what what um, what you should do, what you did, why you did what you did, why it worked. Because that, that helps you move from doing, <laughs> like Prof says, from doing witchcraft to doing evidence-based medicine. Yeah, so read around your patients. When you get a patient, just read around it. Be like, okay, this patient came with this, this, this. Was it a typical presentation? Was it atypical? Why is it typical? Why did they present like this? Why was I worried about this patient? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? So keep asking why. Why should be your favorite word. And even when you're speaking to other providers, if you're a nurse speaking to a doctor, you're a CEO speaking to a consultant, or a doctor speaking to another doctor, Ask why from a place of curiosity, not from a place of condescension. Learn more and you'll be able to manage your patients better. Okay. So also expose yourself more. If you find uh, one of your colleagues is managing a patient and they seem to know what they're doing and it's backed by evidence, um, go see the patient with them. Ask them a few questions. Say, oh, what happened? What did this patient come with? Why did you choose to do what you did? Oh, so this is how you handle this. Because in our field, we learn by apprenticeship a lot of the time. So expose yourself more. That way, especially in terms of emergency medicine, you'll be able to build up on your instincts. You'll be able to build up on your clinician gestalt. You'll be able to pick up red flags faster, intervene faster, and move from type two critical thinking to type one where it's like muscle memory like at the back of your head you're just going 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 okay yep and then of course things in medicine are always changing there are new updates every so often there are new trials and research papers being published every so often try and keep up to date with them yeah try and um keep exposing yourself because like i said we are moving from witchcraft to evidence-based medicine. So keep exposing yourself, keep learning the new guidelines, keep understanding why some things have been removed and the benefit that why you give tranexamic acid to some trauma patients and not others, things like that. Keep learning so that even um, if you're having discussions with other people, you have them from a place of knowledge, yeah? And you can have a good conversation and manage your patients well. Okay. So, like I said, personally, this um 
talk for me was uh, triggered by. I listened to this podcast. It was quite. It was released uh, this month, actually. Uh, there is Rebel EM. It's a very nice EM website, and they have. This is not a. I'm just. I was just very intrigued by this, and they were talking about how you can think in bets because a lot of the things in emergency medicine about probability patterns is my patient going to die if I let them go home are they going to get better things like that so it was a very intriguing conversation so maybe you can have a listen if you want to um there are also many youtube um talks there's a really nice ted talk that also delves into how the fact that we work in an emergency department doesn't mean that we should all be crazy and anxious and panicking because like I said earlier, the, the price, the cost of panicking is too great because you can imagine a patient is brought to you um, <laughs> by their relative, the relative is panicking, and then you as the emergency care provider, you're also panicking. How are you helping each other? Yeah, so maybe just expose yourself to how other people think about things and you'll start to see some similarities. You'll start to pick up new tricks. Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, I have gone on and on and on about all this, but in summary, okay, the main points. Number one, learn to triage your patient, learn to keep triaging them as you go along, as you intervene. Like ATLS usually says, once you intervene, reassess, yeah? So triage your patient, are they sick or not sick, yeah? How sick are they? Are they red zone sick where you need to resuscitate now? Are they yellow zone sick where you need to stabilize or are they green? Okay. Triage your patient. Am I discharging this patient? Am I admitting this patient? And put in those false safes for yourself such that if I'm discharging this patient, do they know what is happening with them? Do they know what to do if any complications arise? Okay. Also ask yourself, is the patient going to die? Are they going to die regardless of what I try to do? Are they going to die because I don't have the, the, the facilities needed to care for such a patient? And make, make fast decisions as you're doing that. Um, whenever you see your patient, think with the worst in mind. The worst, you could die from ABCD or you have abdominal pain. It could be a, a ruptured aneurysm. Think of the worst. And then work down until you prove beyond reasonable doubt that it's not that. Okay. Now the thing you're always working in teams, so make sure to communicate um, clearly, concisely with the with the team that is part of your patient care as well as the patient. It makes things easier, makes things flow faster. Um, yeah. Like I said, reassess again and again and again and again and again until the patient leaves your unit. Keep reassessing them because things could change at a moment notice. I'm a little superstitious in the fact that I believe that patients deteriorate once they reach the hospital. They can be fine and stable until they step into your hospital and then boom, their reserves are done and they decompensate. So keep reassessing, keep looking for red flags. And keep exposing yourself to patients, whether it's directly or indirectly, whether it's through literature, whether it's through um, asking your colleagues about a patient who they've seen, but keep exposing yourself. It's the only way that you'll become more and more confident in your craft uh, because you'll be able to pick up patterns. Yeah. So, and that's the only way that you'll be able to develop instincts that are worth something and that are backed by data. Okay. Lastly, panic serves absolutely nobody, absolutely nobody. So always keep calm, keep calm, um, lean on your resources, lean on the app. Uh, and yeah, if you do everything right and your patient dies, they were meant to die, right? But if your patient dies and you know you could have done more, that's the one that won't let you sleep at night. That's the overarching thought you'll have in the back of your head forever and ever. Yeah, okay. I have spoken a lot. Uh, eight minutes to spare, so I guess we can do some. If there are any questions or contributions that anybody has, um, feel free to put them in the 
in the chat box. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a question. Do we check physically if a patient is sick or not? Okay. At the start of your practice, you will know you will notice that even if you look at um students or recently graduated um students, they they are very good at history taking and physical exam. You should always examine your patient, yes. But as you go further and further in your practice, you learn to pick out subtle signs and symptoms, even while standing at the foot of the bed or even while walking across. There are multiple times I've been walking to get water in our unit. And I see, I glance a patient through a curtain this way and I'm like, Ay! and then I double take and I'm like, that patient doesn't look good. So physically examine your patients, yes. Keep learning to identify these danger signs, these red flags as you go along. And with time, it will become second nature. It will be like an automatic thing just running in the background, just going. Yep. I hope you guys have learned something. And I hope it, it while I know the title is very daunting, how to think like an emergency care provider, I hope this um, talk has shown you a bit of insight into some of the things that you need to always keep in mind. Eh?